All right, so reviewing last time on our Molly lecture. Molly rose after Ghana fell, and we had talked about how the kingdom of Molly came in the year 1235. They were able to reestablish the gold salt trade that went away. The emperor Sunjiata was able to defeat the local kings. And as we saw also in the um, home team history video, he was able to defeat the king, king Sosa, and he was able to unite it back to being one empire. So it was now Ghana's borders, like before, from the year 800 to 1076, but he made it even larger. So after 1235, it became a larger empire, and Mali was able to reestablish the gold salt trade. All right, so continuing. The Mali Empire is able to take over Timbuktu. Timbuktu was a city that existed. What happened was it was outside of Mali's borders. So basically what Mali is able to do is they're able to extend their borders and they're able to take over the city of Timbuktu, and they're able to make it into a major trading, university, education city. There were three universities we talked before that were in Timbuktu. And book writing, as we saw, was also a major industry. This is before there was a printing press at this time, so the books were written by hand in Arabic. Now, for a comparison, in Mali, one guy named Ahmed Baba had 1,600 books in his personal library. He was a West African. A guy from Mali had 1,600 books in his personal collection. BABA. -B -A. So he had 1,600 books in his collection. In comparison, in Europe at this time, if you were in a monastery, which is one of the places that had the most books, they might have six or seven in the whole monastery. There were many more books that existed in Timbuktu than Europe at this time. And the universities. People from Arabia would come to these universities, North Africa, even some Europeans went to Timbuktu to study. Yep, you get 1,600 books. So people from Arabia, North Africa, and even Europe would come to study at Timbuktu. And these books can still be found today. The city of Timbuktu, there are literally buildings that are housing these old books. Historians have found them. Um, there were 180 Quranic schools, which pretty much Quranic meant schools of the Quran or Islamic schools that exist in Timbuktu. Uh, there were 180 schools. And also you want to think Timbuktu would be just a city where people are going in, they're going out, there's the gold salt trade, but other products are being traded. It is a large international city. It is the focal or the main city on what's called the Trans-Saharan Trade Route. It is the major city of the Trans-Saharan Trade Route. Think of it like the Silk Road, like a Baghdad or a Samarkand that we talked about in the Silk Road, but instead it was like the Gold Road. It was like uh, it was like a Silk Road city. It was a major city where people were trading back and forth. What was the name of it? Baghdad, Samarkand, ones that we had written in our Silk Road paper. It was like one of those cities. All right, so let's talk Mansa Musa, and he was also in your reading that was due for today. So, also remember for this test, you want to include information from both the reading and the lecture. Both should be in it. So Mansa Musa, he was able to bring back a strong central government to Mali. He was able to bring a strong central government to Mali. Mansa Musa is also known as being the richest man ever to have lived in the earth. 
He is the richest man ever to have lived on the earth. Go ahead, Google it. Google the question, who was the richest person ever to have lived? Not just today, ever. Almost every site will give you Matsa Musa. And the reason why is because Matsa Musa was the king. Got it? See? Hold it. Hold the You good? Maybe you just Google it right now on your phones. Matsa Musa was the richest person to have ever lived. All right, so Matsa Musa. Richest person ever to have lived. And the reason why is because he was the Mansa or the king of the Mali Empire. So what does the word Mansa mean? King. king. So he was the king of the Mali Empire. And technically in Mali, the king owned all the gold. So if he owned all of Mali's gold, which was two-thirds of the world's gold at this time, that's why he's so rich. And again, why do, how do we know that the kings in Mali were so rich? We've already looked at some of the primary sources that talk about this and how they had all this gold and all this wealth. So, Matsa Musa was rich because of the gold, but also because the gold salt trade was established, and they taxed it. So if you were a foreigner who came in to trade for this gold, you had to pay taxes. And this continued the gold... Uh, being put into coins and being used in the Trans-Saharan trade route, the Silk Road, the Indian Ocean trade route, all over the world. <clears throat> now, Matsa Musa makes many stunning buildings and mosques. When they captured the city of Timbuktu in 1325, 1325 they capture the city of Timbuktu, he starts building the city up. Starts beautifying the city like Pericles did to Athens. 1325, conquered Timbuktu. So Mansa Musa built a royal palace in Timbuktu. He built another huge mosque in Jenny. And if you came to the 4.0 lunch, you saw that mosque with the remains of it, or how it's been rebuilt today. He built a, another mosque at Jenny. And another great mosque at a city called Gao, G. A O. Oh, so Jenny, Gao, and Timbuktu are areas where he built huge mosques. Now, in Timbuktu, he wanted to be the best university city possible. He wanted to bring the best and the brightest. So he thought, who were the best scholars? And he thought the Arabs were the best scholars with their Arabic learning, their books they've had for a long time. So he brings Arabic scholars into Timbuktu. But he finds something out when he brings them in. He finds out that um, uh, actually his own scholars in Timbuktu are equal to them or even better. So Timbuktu had some of the best university basically professors in the world at this time. Now, what he's most famous for is his pilgrimage. His great pilgrimage. He goes there every year. Uh, well, I'll tell you about his, the one he's most famous for. So Mansa Musa goes to Mecca. And we can go back and look at our map on that. We did it for the do now. So Mansa Musa travels all the way to Mecca for a pilgrimage. And he does this in the year 1324. Now, according to the legend, he took 60,000 people with him. He took 60,000 people with him. <laughs> Each person that came with him carried three kilograms of gold. How much is a kilogram? 2.2 pounds. So 60,000 people, each person reportedly had about seven pounds of gold. So just under seven pounds of gold. That's a lot. How's my math on that one? So we take them... Um, uh, Seven times 60,000, what do I get for that? Yeah, we're looking at about, seven, seven. we're looking at about 420,000 pounds of gold. That is a huge amount of gold. So anyway, now, do we know, shh, 
And this is the exact number. Some historians dispute how much he brought. They said he didn't quite bring that much. But we know it was a huge amount of gold. Now, what he does is he goes to Mecca. That's one of his responsibilities as a Muslim. Another one of his responsibilities as, as a Muslim is to give to the poor. And he's a guy who's loaded with gold. So what he does on his way back from Mecca all the way back to Timbuktu in the Malian Empire is he starts and his people around him are giving away gold all the way back. So much so that people start following him. Well, I would. You make a good day's work in that. Um, what happens is in the city of Cairo, for example, that becomes a problem there. What happens to the price of gold if this guy is giving all this gold away? Yeah. The price of gold goes down. What that means is gold's not worth as much. So it's good that he's giving away all this gold, but if you had gold before this, you'd be mad. Because you'd be like, this gold I used to have is now worth not worth as much. Also, legends are being told now about how much gold is in West Africa which will lead to problems as other people start coming into West Africa looking for resources in the future. So, um, and how does this, does this help the gold salt trade or hurt it? It hurts it because now you have, this is your main commodity, what you are trading, and the king is giving it away. Giving it away. So there is some potential problems with this. Now, on the good side, He's giving away gold to a lot of people who have nothing, nothing and they, they now have something. But he gives that away, and because of that, it actually hurts Molly on the gold and salt trade. Are you a good person? I would say he was a good person, though, yeah. All right, let's continue. Now, the decline and fall of Molly. So, Molly starts to get weaker. What happens is they have really good emperors like Sunjiata, who starts the empire. Mansa Musa, despite giving away the gold, is running things well. Mansa Musa is kind of like the golden age. Uh -uh, see what I did there? Anyway, so, no, no. What is it? So Mansa Musa was really in the golden age. Uh, no, I don't get it. No, 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 no. no. Oh, okay. I was gonna keep going. All right, so. I'm sorry. Oh. Anyway, we'll continue. So Matsumusa is ruling in yeah, okay, the best age in Mali. And what happens is in the 1400s, Mali starts to decline and fall. It's because a lot of the rulers who follow Matsumusa are weak and they're not as powerful as he was. And also what happens is many of them become corrupt. They're more interested in doing building projects than keeping the people safe and happy. So what happens is more and more of their neighbors start to invade in the borders of Mali. And when you have a kingdom with all this gold there, pretty soon the neighbors are going to want piece of the action. And they start to greatly reduce the power in Mali. And what happens in the east is the city of Gao becomes more and more of a big deal. The city of Gao is where the future Sungai Empire will start. So Mali will be taken over by the Sungai. So the Gao people they are in the Malian Empire. I think we got Mali. We got the city of Timbuktu. We got Gao right here. We got Timbuktu. What do you mean by weak rulers who follow Mansamusa? There's weak rulers who are more interested in doing building projects than are interested in running things, the gold and salt trade, keeping the people safe. So the city of Gao starts to rise. And as the city of Gao rises, Timbuktu and the Malian Empire starts to fall and become weaker. And what happens is, eventually, Sungai will overtake the Mali Empire. So Sungai will eventually overtake and rule the Mali Empire. 